Hello, I'm Harley Schlanger from the Schiller Institute. Welcome to this week's webcast with our founder and president, Helga Zepp LaRouche. Today is December 12th, 2018. We're doing it a day earlier this week, but we're, we're in a situation, an extremely exciting and dramatic strategic situation. Uh, the warnings of, of crisis are, are now coming out everywhere. Uh, we're seeing shifts in Europe and uh, potential for major change in the United States as well. So Helga, let's start with the situation in France where we've seen Macron knocked off his high horse in the last days. What's, what's going on there? Well, Macron who came into uh, office um, a little bit more than a year ago, uh, <clears throat> failed to address the rage factor in the French population, which had been building up since many years, as a matter of fact, one can say decades. And when he started to implement the consequences of his uh, COP21 uh, Paris climate deal, namely to increase the taxes on uh, gasoline and other fuels, the rage exploded and the Yellow West movement, uh, basically ordinary people who can't make ends meet you know, as one of the Yellow West uh, representatives said, these ecologists, they talk always about the end of the world. But for us, it's a question how we make it to the end of the month. So then within four weeks, um, <clears throat> this movement uh, grew and, you know, some provo provocations were mixed in, but that does not change the general character of this movement. So then uh, uh, two days ago, Macron was forced to basically reverse his entire neoliberal reform program, which he had been uh, implementing. Now, that really shows that the neoliberal uh, paradigm does not function. Uh, the reaction uh, to this was, was a total freak out. Uh, the Italians, naturally, who had been <clears throat> harassed by Macron and Brussels, uh, that they should uh, not uh, not violate the stability pact rules in terms of the uh, budget deficit. They wanted 2.4% and the EU imposed something like 2%. But then they quickly calculated <clears throat> that if uh, Macron uh, is uh, carrying out all the promises he made in his big speech two days ago, namely increasing the minimum wage, increasing the pensions, uh, and you know, not not imposing these uh, taxes, uh, taxations, uh, that would bring the French budget deficit to 3.4 percent, and that would even go beyond the Maastricht criteria, <coughs> which is higher than those of the Stability Pact. Now, obviously, you know, this um, means that every country which has been bothered by the EU imposing these uh, insane austerity measures now feels reinforced. So the reverberations of this, uh, we have to see. Uh, naturally, the neoliberal media completely went out of control. The German conservative uh, die, uh, weekly Die Welt said, <coughs> now with uh, Macron, France is the new Italy, uh, basically saying that Macron is uh, no longer the partner in solving the EU and Euro crisis, uh, but he is the risk. and they accuse him of crawling, really using an unbelievable language, crawling in front of the yellow vests. So naturally, this is an incredible situation. Many uh, people on the scene said this is uh, what Macron did is too little too late. And then naturally, uh, today, uh, the situation dramatically changed uh, because there was yet another terrorist attack in Stras Strasbourg. Um, where uh, a person of uh, Islamist background supposedly uh, shot around in several places in the city and then went to the Christmas market, killed three people, uh, <clears throat> wounded another uh, 12. He got shot at himself, so he's wounded, but he managed to escape with a stolen taxi car. And naturally, Macron immediately uh, declared a state of emergency in many major cities. So how that will play out now uh, with the Yellow uh, <clears throat> West movement uh, remains to be seen. But it just shows that the whole situation is absolutely unstable and 
uh, that the neoliberal paradigm, you know, which you know we have been discussing now for quite a while, which led to the Brexit, the defeat of Hillary Clinton, the election of the new Italian government, the yellow uh, vest movement, all of these are symptoms of the same thing that you cannot violate the common good of the normal people endlessly in favor of the very rich. And in France, you know, the rage is directed against the very rich, which they say Macron is the president of, uh, that you cannot violate these interests uh, forever without causing really earthquakes. And, you know, I think that this is uh, <coughs> foreboding uh, the demise of the EU, because the EU is uh, has uh, proven itself to be absolutely incapable of reform and uh, therefore I think we are in for many more turbulent uh, days and weeks and possibly months. I think there are two aspects of this that are, are just worth developing a little bit more uh, because they do demonstrate something that you've been saying from the very beginning and when we started these webcasts. Number one, austerity doesn't function and we're seeing a total rebellion against these austerity policies of the European Union. In the United States, you have Republicans and Democrats both going with anti-austerity policies. But secondly, the rejection of the French people of the Paris climate control. And there was just a recent conference where I think it was the Russians and uh, the, the uh, United States, President Trump and one other country, the Saudis came out against these climate policies. So this is part of the new paradigm, isn't it? Yes, I think it is the environment for the new paradigm uh, to to develop. However, you know what is really required now is a mobilization uh, for the solution because the other major um, uh, danger on on as a cloud over hanging over us is naturally the danger of a new financial crash. And you know, in a certain sense, uh, the, the, the situation is in one sense more dangerous than in 2008, but it's also more favorable because you have in Italy a government which has uh, an active campaign for the implementation of Glass Eagle, for <clears throat> the joining of Italy with the Belt and Road Initiative, with good relations not only to China, but also to, to the United States. And with Trump, you have a president uh, in in the White House, who is not exactly 100% in the pocket of Wall Street, even if you know that the, there are many efforts to to get him exactly there, but I think the warnings of a new financial crash are are absolutely everywhere. Janet Yellen, uh, the former, uh, I think she was the head of the um, Federal Reserve at one point. She said that all the parameters of 2008 are there, uh, that even the corporate debt is twice as much as 2007. It's now $9.1 trillion. And even the New York Times of all places, which is sort of one of the organs of the Wall Street, basically warned of the new crash of 2019. Uh, pointing to many of the correct uh, dangers and also some invented ones. Uh, one of the correct ones being the student debt. The student debt in the United States is a whopping 1.5 trillion. 20% uh, of those are already, uh, you know, uh, not not uh, performing because these students cannot pay back. They they don't have job expectations when they finish their studies, and it is expected, according to the New York Times, that that student debt will be 40% non-performing. Uh, in just a few years. And, you know, that's just one of the many landmines where the New York Times article is completely wrong, however, is to lump the Chinese debt into the same ballpark, because contrary to the speculative debt, corporate debt, student debt uh, in the West, the Chinese debt has been expended for investment in the real economy, and therefore is of a completely different nature because it creates real wealth. But apart from that, the warnings that a new crash is uh, pending, uh, you know, also one of the governors of the Federal Reserve uh, basically issued the same warning in respect to the corporate debt. 
So I think our mobilization for a new Bretton Woods is more urgent than ever. And I would urge you, the viewers and, and listeners, uh, that you should absolutely join the Schiller Institute and join our mobilization to, to get that kind of a change in the credit system, to get rid of the casino economy and get a credit system to really put this on the agenda before it is too late. It's worth noting that when Janet Yellen stepped down as Federal Reserve Chairman, she gave an interview in which she said, there will not be another crisis in our lifetime. And now she's saying there are gigantic holes in the system. And as you point out, uh, she uh, pointed her finger at the corporate debt, the non-financial corporate debt. And of course, we also know there's an enormous amount of financial corporate debt, that is the banks carrying these derivatives. Now. Uh, the crisis is continuing to uh, just smash through all the countries of Europe, but and, and there's a new phase uh, entering in Britain now in the United Kingdom, where Theresa May faces a vote of no confidence tonight uh, on, over Brexit. Uh, this looks like this could be an extremely important moment, especially since we now see something you brought up last week, this integrity initiative is intervening in, in the United Kingdom against her main opponent, uh, Corbyn. So catch us up on that, Helga. Well, the Brexit vote naturally um, was a rebellion against the imposition of EU policies, austerity policies. And you know, if you look at the incredible rates of poverty in, in Great Britain, the terrible condition of the health system you know, none of these uh, conditions has, has become any better, but to the contrary. So uh, May, uh, May survive this confidence vote or not. In case she loses it, um, then naturally there are several of Tory leaders who are named. Uh, I don't think any one of them means uh, a much better condition because the Brexit vote uh, has been postponed. But when May went to Holland, to Berlin, to Brussels uh, in the last days, as some newspapers said, begging the EU to change the condition, she got a complete flat no from the EU and also the other governments uh, she visited. So the Brexit vote uh, hangs in the air. She may, have, you know, that she may be voted out of government today. So this is a a situation of utmost stability and in the context of these warnings of a new financial crash, I mean, if there is an unorderly uh, Brexit, then naturally the big question is what happens to the derivative markets of the city of London? And, you know, I should just mention one other factor of financial instability, which shows you how traumatic this situation is, is the fact that the shares of Deutsche Bank uh, have fallen to uh, 7.24 euro. Uh, now, it was always said 10 euro is the absolute red line. After that, Deutsche Bank goes bankrupt. Then that red line was uh, put at uh, 8 euro. Uh, now the expectation is that it will be 6.50 soon and, and then 5 euro. And naturally, uh, that practically means Deutsche Bank is insolvent and the only option is a government uh, takeover because uh, fusion uh, who wants to fuse with a <clears throat> with a bank for bank and you know if they would fuse it with commerzbank which is partly a state bank already uh, which is also uh, reported to be in in big trouble so this really shows the brexit derivative market deutsche bank i mean we may be in for real shocks and i think that the all the so-called mainstream uh, traditional experts uh, warn of this uh, new financial crash really should wake people up, but not to just you know say, where can I save my money and can I go into gold or some other speculative uh, activity? But you know, it should really be clear that if there is a repetition of 2008, all the instruments of the central bank banks have been used up and there would be a danger of a plunge into chaos. So therefore, again, you know, the four laws of Lyndon LaRouche, my husband, must be put on the agenda right now. Klaus Stiegel, banking separation, 
national bank power of the credit generation in the sovereign control of governments and then an international credit system uh, which will allow <clears throat> to finance large uh, and long-term projects of the real economy such as infrastructure international development projects and the like and there must be that kind of a change uh, because if that is not done before the crisis hits, the danger is really an uncontrolled collapse. And you mentioned Deutsche Bank. The, the only thing that would work for that, you know, forget a nationalization or a bailout, you need Glass-Steagall to separate out the, the worthless assets and then put it through a bankruptcy reorganization. Now, as we're looking at this overall financial situation, we're seeing uh, positive developments now coming from the G20 summit between uh, the, the special meeting between President Xi Jinping and Donald Trump. Uh, it looks as though this is moving on, on a very positive development. Uh, what's the latest on the China-US talks? Well, it's a little bit complicated because there are both positive and negative uh, signs. On the positive side, for sure, uh, this is also reflected in a whole series of tweets by Trump uh, that the after the summit, Xi Jinping, Trump, the trade negotiations uh, are again on a good footing. Uh, Liu He, who is the major economic advisor of Xi Jinping, uh, communicated with Mnuchin and Lighthizer. Uh, and it seems that the Chinese are now basically reducing their tariffs, especially on cars, uh, from 40% back to 15%, which is the general uh, tariff for all countries, not just the United States. So that seems to move in, in a <clears throat> positive direction. But naturally, there was an absolute provocation where it seems that Trump uh, was sort of caught on the left foot because uh, the U.S. Department of Justice requested from Canada to arrest the chief financial officer of the uh, <coughs> firm Huawei, a producer of many electronic devices, smartphones, and so forth. And uh, basically, I think she's out on bail now, uh, but she can't leave the specific province in, in Canada where she is. Uh, but, you know, the Chinese officials reacted with a very... Uh, you know, angry of a response saying that this is not uh, going to uh, met with uh, indifference by China. And Wang Yi uh, <clears throat> even said, you know, that the China will absolutely not allow this kind of bullying. Uh, so that could be a disturbing uh, factor. And whoever initiated that, uh, which is really another case of this uh, really internationally illegal extraterritorial uh, implementation of U.S. jurisdiction, you know, which is not accepted by by other countries. So <clears throat> I think that that is um, uh, very complicated and, and fragile. Uh, at a meeting of uh, a symposium uh, of uh, Chinese um, international development and diplomacy, which just is taking place in Beijing, uh, the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi uh, basically, again, said, you know, the whole world stability really is largely dependent on the relationship between the United States and China, because these are the two uh, most important economies of the world. Uh, and if they cooperate, then it is good not only for the two countries, but for the whole world. If they are on the course of confrontation, not only the two of them will suffer, but the whole world. And then he called upon uh, the United States to give up its zero-sum mentality and, and find the path to cooperation. So I think, you know, it's uh, hopeful that, you know, Trump, when he sent out a tweet uh, yesterday or so, he said, uh, things are marching forward, expect announcements uh, pretty soon. Well, I hope I hope that this will be uh, you know, a positive thing. But, you know, as I said, unless you really remedy the overall causes of the strategic instability, which is the pending crash of the system and the demise of the neoliberal order, uh, you know, the danger of any new provocation leading to new crises and new complications will remain there 
So therefore we need the big package of reforms. And we're seeing very significant developments on the question of cooperation around the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there was the speech by the Italian finance minister, Tria, about Italy's involvement in the importance of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, a motion in Portugal, uh, Serbia. Uh, this is continuing a, a, a march forward, and it's essential that the United States join this. Yes, I think, you know, if you look at the extremely uh, quick path, uh, pace of the integration of many countries with the Belt and Road Initiative, it is actually remarkable. And this speech you mentioned of the Italian finance minister, Tria, I really think is, is very important because Tria, uh, who was as a young student from 77 to 79, uh, in Beijing studying. Uh, he speaks fluently Mandarin. And he actually in this speech pointed to the absolutely incredible transformation China has un undergone in the last 40 years. And I sort of, uh, you know, can understand exactly what he means because I was also in China in 71. And, you know, it's a huge difference if you have seen the China before the <clears throat> opening up uh, initiated by Deng Xiaoping, uh, namely, you know, in the time of the Cultural Revolution or when uh, Tria was there, 77, that was just at the end of it, uh, because it, it's really two completely different worlds. One was one of poverty, uh, complete underdevelopment um, in the political realm, also reign of terror with the Red Guards and the Gang of Four. And then now you have a country which is completely transformed and they just made a poll. Um, <clears throat> basically, it was a British think tank, uh, amazingly enough. And they found that 90% of all the Chinese people uh, absolutely look optimistically in the future. They think that uh, China in 10 years from now will be even much, much better and uh, fully developed. And you know they have total confidence in, in their government. So I think that this is really, uh, you know, anybody who studies this seriously cannot fall for this uh, absolute negative uh, narrative, which is coming from most of the geopolitically motivated think tanks of the West. But, you know, the countries who, who cooperate, like Italy, um, Tria in the same speech in Rome he made uh, two days ago, pointed to the fact, you know, that it is uh, the Belt and Road Initiative which is the driver for the Italian economy uh, to cooperate on all of these projects, you know, infrastructure, science, uh, ports, airports, uh, just, just many, many areas uh, is extremely beneficial for the Italian economy and especially the cooperation in third countries like Africa, uh, Latin America and others. So I think that that is really, you know, in a certain sense, that's the only optimistic direction you can see. And there were similar conferences in Algeria, as you said, where uh, the authorities uh, said, you know, that uh, Algeria wants to be uh, a transmission belt for uh, trade between the rest of the world and Africa. Then you had a big conference in Belgrade, uh, which had the subject Belt and Road Initiative in the Balkans. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, in a certain sense, there is a lot of such motion going on. There was also a quite interesting conference in Berlin uh, where the vice president of uh, Nigeria uh, reiterated on a question of, I think yourself, Harley, uh, that uh, the Nigerian government is absolutely committed to the realization of the Transaqua project. So, you know, you can really see that the world is divided into two kinds of uh, patterns. One is you know, just trying to keep a speculative system going, which is failing. And the other one is countries which are oriented towards the real economy and they are cooperating with, with China. So I think that, you know, this is really, you know, people have to choose, you know, do you want to be on the side of winning the new paradigm uh, or not. And I think one of the most uh, incredible developments uh, is that just uh, today and tomorrow, 
there is the landing of the Chang'e 4 mission on the far side of the moon, the Chinese program, which in a certain sense makes China now the leading space power in the world because no other country has yet undertaken it to go to the far side of the moon, which obviously uh, requires, you know, satellites as relay stations. And, you know, it's a very exciting uh, new step of mankind uh, in the discovery of how our universe really works. Yeah, this is, it's really quite amazing to think about it, that the Chinese have leapfrogged beyond the United States to, to take up this mission to the moon. Now, as we're looking at the overall situation, there are a couple of things I think that we just have to mention because they do represent the kind of dangers and threats that, that we've been discussing over the last months. Uh, one is the announcement by Poroshenko, the uh, leader of Ukraine who was put in by this coup run by the neocons. Poroshenko just uh, signed something to end the Russia-Ukraine friendship agreement. Uh, this is very dangerous on top of the intervention by three Ukrainian naval vessels into the Kerch Straits a couple weeks ago. Yes, I think it's um, very significant because it uh, basically takes away the basis for agreements uh, of uh, seafaring in the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait. So the danger is naturally that a repetition of the kind of incident which we have seen just before the G20 summit, which led to the sabotage of the planned summit between Putin and uh, Trump, uh, that that could uh, happen at any moment. And, you know, the fact that there is a big British intervention in the Ukraine, um, namely the so-called Brigade 77, they are in Ukraine deployed, trying to support uh, Poroshenko in the election campaign. I mean, this is really one of the dangerous flashpoints uh, in the strategic equation right now. Yeah, it's another example of British interference in an election. Uh, now, on that, we have the latest on Mueller. There's a lot that could be said, but I think the most important thing is just that he's changing the whole narrative, that since they have nothing on Russia, they have nothing on Trump collusion, they're now going after Trump on uh, alleged payments to silence or to cover up affairs, and also the, the machinations of his former attorney Cohen to try to negotiate with some unknown entity in Moscow for a Trump Tower, saying this proves that Trump was interested in uh, working with Putin and getting money. Uh, it looks as though this thing is ripe for being taken down, doesn't it? Well, I think, you know, this is a fishing expedition, if I ever have seen one, you know, because obviously, in the whole one and a half years or however, however long it's taken, uh, Mueller was completely unable to prove anything concerning uh, Russia collusion. And if the Trump uh, <clears throat> team had business contacts uh, with uh, counterparts in Russia, this is not collusion. These are business deals. And, you know, this uh, affairs about women and so forth, again, you know, I mean, you may have this opinion or that opinion about it, but it has nothing to do with Russia collusion. So it is a fishing uh, expedition. And, you know, I think, you know, the only remedy to stop this would be the immediate declassification of all documents relating to Christopher Steele, to the FISA court manipulation, to the role of the British, to the motives of why all of this Russia gate was, was uh, done. And I think that this is what is uh, urgently required. And, you know, from our own, uh, you know, interaction with uh, Trump supporters, uh, I think one can say very clearly that, you know, they need to get a little bit more mobilized. Uh, too many of them are just at the sidelines, you know, looking at this, saying how it will go, will Trump eventually be gotten or not gotten, they must understand that this is a moment, you know, of, of great danger, of great opportunity, but they need to mobilize and demand the declassification, demand class legal, demand that Trump uh, can actually deliver on all of his election promises, including a good relationship with Russia and China, uh, but especially to rebuild the American economy 
which is only possible with the four laws of Linda LaRouche, because if you don't do these kinds of changes, uh, you can simply not finance the kind of build up the American economy needs. So in a certain sense, you know, the Trump supporters must really get off their behind. You know, I think it's um, extremely important that you are not complacent, that, you know, that, you know, this is really, if Trump would be uh, ousted, which, you know, some of the most crazy Democrats are still talking about, uh, <clears throat> then naturally, you know, this, uh, this is uh, plunging us directly back into the danger of a big confrontation with Russia and China and possible war. So do not be complacent and do understand the role of the British in this because, you know, too many people, uh, you know, including those who, who recognize that the British did have a role, they don't put it together and they don't see that it is the old game of the British Empire, uh, which has never accepted that the American independence uh, occurred and who have tried to undo that uh, basically since the American Revolution. So <clears throat> I would really end. I hope so.